my good side? Should we switch chairs? I have a good side. Yeah. There you go. Um, should I dig in? You start. I did a lot of homework. I wrote a thesis on Zadie for tonight. Right. Um, I don't know. Uh, where did I want to start? I guess I want to start talking. Uh, we met, uh, I see Antonio's here. We met in Italy uh, at the Capri Festival 10,000 years ago. Yes. But we were there with um, uh, Franzen and Eugenides and David Foster Wallace. And I've been around a lot of writers with you over the years. Yes. But I don't think I've ever seen the kind of reverence, you know, that you had for David, I guess. It's, it's an essay. It's the last essay in your book. And it's a stunning essay. And I guess I wanted to address that. Um, that was a kind of, it's, it was a weird uh, trip um, because I'd never seen so many writers in their swimwear apart from anything else. <laughs> um, and uh, I f I'm w when I met you there, I, I In my tankini. Yeah, <laughs> in tankini. I was really scared all the time. It was only a five-day trip, but I, yeah. I thought we kind of ganged together in fear amongst the greatness we were walking around with. Um, but I, I was awed by him. I, I, I think... And it strikes me when I think back to that time um, that I didn't talk to him at all about his writing, which reminds me of, of us too. I was going to say, yeah. Writer friendship, you talk about everything on earth apart from the books you've written and this anything at all about time. writing. This is the first time we've ever discussed writing uh, with each other. And it was the same with him. You know, I, I was writing that essay when I met him. I continued mm. writing it until um, uh, he died. But I'd never discussed any of those uh, things with him. The only in-depth discussion we had was about hair, he asked me about black hair <laughs> and how it works in this incredibly nerdy way. And I uh, tried to explain the various procedure and some people straighten it, and some people yeah. curl it, and some people flat. He was utterly fascinated. Mm -hmm. But that remained our only, um, our serious talk. There's some people you, you admire so much you can't speak to them. Yeah. Well then let's speak about him for a second. I guess uh, I am, as you know, a giant Marilyn Robinson obsessive and it was John Gardner in high school, but I deeply where I, you know, uh, I'm really John Gardner. Well, in high school, yeah, like that's exactly. But on moral fiction, those yeah. books. But those are really bit. My point is, it's like it's almost hard to explain. Or a fully degenerate, drunk, perverted mess of a bunch of people, like the writers as a whole. Yeah. But um, but that's a whole separate matter. Your outside perversions. That, you know what I'm saying? You could I say eat a bowl of babies for breakfast. I don't care what you do. <laughs> but I believe there's like a very serious system of weights and measures. You know, that there's a, I, I deeply, deeply believe that there's a morale, you cannot write. You know what I'm saying? You can be psychotic during the day, but you have to understand what is good and what is evil when you're working. And I like that you said, look, I have a quote. The moralist in Wallace, that part of him that wanted not only to describe the room wound, but to heal it. And I guess I just wanted to talk about a moral fiction for a second. Well, I, I mean, he was always very interested in Gardner too, but, but the problem comes where you say a moral writer needs to be a moral person. He was quite careful about yeah, the yeah. difference there. The morality happens on, on the page, and it also happens in an, in an inverse way. There's a great George Saunders quote where he says um, uh, that m writing is the inverse, pr sorry, sorry, the inverse praise of good things, his writing. Yeah. So it seems um, you know, vicious and mean and, and to convey this awful world, but it's, its other side, its photographic kind of inverse is what he's hoping for. And I think that's the way I'm thinking when I'm writing. You can't write in a, a dogmatic or forcefully moral way, but you can suggest in some kind of inverse way a pattern of the good life. And I was saying to you just before we came on here, this uh, recently um, Foster Wallace's archives have gone to a library, yeah. and the, a journalist describing them was surprised to find that his notes in books like What is Art by Tolstoy yeah. um, were incredibly thorough. And he makes a little note by the side saying, a little question, art as empathy? question mark. Right. And that was his entire pursuit, you know, yeah. kind of combined in a tiny little quote. But it wasn't always obvious on the surface. No, not at all. Um, I get, uh, how could read nine more quotes about that? But I guess I was, that was a beautiful speech, Faria, by the way. Uh, I try not to cry before I get on stage. I try <laughs> to cry on stage. <laughs> it's not an easy night to do an event when there's that big article in the Times that the Y had to give all their money back from their talk last night. Yeah. Did everyone see that? There will be no refunds. It's charity. <laughs> if we die, we die. And I want to talk about comics dying, too. Um, anyway, but, uh, oh, I guess this whole evening is about providing opportunity and education. And uh, it's not just books and pencils. Um, there's more to it than that. But I guess I was really thinking uh, um, we have very different backgrounds, but a lot of si 
The, uh, I want to talk about types of writers. You write beautifully okay. about that micro and micro. I'm going to go through all my questions now without asking a one. It'll <laughs> take just 17 more minutes. <laughs> but um, no, but really this is the idea, you know, I, I want to talk about Keats, who's from Hampstead, and I'm from Hampstead. But um, oh, yes. it's the nice. other thing. Yeah, oh. they were very yeah. close. But the point is, we both came to writing sort of on our own. You know, you end up in this world, we heard about accents and all that stuff. And I guess I was really interested in ideas of entitlement. Like, it's not only needing to succeed against whatever the odds are, but knowing you can su succeed. I, I want to read, I'm going to read a quote. Okay. I got a couple of quotes. And then we'll talk, but I love this moment. It really made me, I already loved Kiki, because it's sort of the end of the book, you better love her by then. <laughs> yeah, but, um, after 500 pages. After 500 yeah. pages, it's only 424. <laughs> but um, I don't know, this moment really touched me. Two hours later, I'm going to read in Zadie voice. No, I won't. Two hours later, Kiki lifted a box of sorted papers and carried it into the hallway. All these journals and notes and stories he had written before he was 16, she admired the weight of it in her arms. In her head, she was making another speech to the Black American Mothers Guild. Well, you just have to offer them encouragement and the correct role models, and you have to pass on the idea of entitlement. Both my sons feel entitled, and that's why they achieve. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of slightly r ripping on my mother there. She was always, uh, it, it, I, we were all the first generation to go to university, um, me and my brothers, um, and she had left school at, at 14. So it was a kind of obsessive matter for her. Um, and we went to a big, crowded, I guess you call public school. Um, so it was always a bit of a battle. Actually, when Faria was talking, I was remembering um, uh, when I was in school in the early 90s, uh, there's a big Somalian influx into our school because of the war. Um, and there was, a in fact, a charity in our school called Children of the Storm, which was for refugee children. Um, but seeing those kids in class, like we thought of ourselves as really struggling, you know, we're kind of working class kids desperate to get an education. And then suddenly this whole other level of experience was in, in front of us. And it was a kind of, sorry, go on. I'm just so happy to have something to ask this question because I was in yeshiva and suddenly we had, like, I didn't even know what Iran or Iraq was. Suddenly we had all these kids who just showed up, you know, like Bob Akhmatahede and his uh, Michael Jackson. Re I don't know how they came and also suddenly had a good Michael Jackson leather jacket. I wanted that <laughs> thriller jacket. But my point is we didn't think to ask them a single, I can't believe the school didn't have an assembly no. and be like, these people are from Baghdad. But we didn't, no. we didn't ask them a question. We just said, you're now Ashkenazi Jews. This is how we pray. I have to tell you, it's, a, it's actually a really sad story, but I, I hadn't thought about it in a long time, but there was a Somali girl in our class. Of course, none of us had asked her a single question. We knew nothing. Uh, we weren't interested. This is how the charity came about. And in the middle of the class one day, she started banging her head really hard against the desk. And nobody, you know, we hadn't even, we weren't even speaking her language. We had mm. no idea what was going on. And the charity kind of responded. Um, it came to be because of that. But in a school like that, where you have about 110 languages spoken, I think they still claim, um, and this extraordinary uh, diversity, um, you're constantly kind of displaced from yourself. Can I put it that way? Because there's not enough people to make a solid group. Like mm -hmm. Even uh, my group, it might not seem like a group to this room, but the group of mixed race girls whose mothers are black, that was a <laughs> little thing to itself. Then there were the mixed race girls whose mothers are white. It was like an incredible um, uh, pattern of distinctions. Um, and it, uh, I find now when I'm writing, I, it's hard for me to put that variety out of my mind, you know? I, and I wanted to ask you about that too, because when you're writing, uh, you can't help but think about audience a little bit. And I'm always struck, like when I wrote my second book in which, you know, a lot of the characters are Jewish, some of them are Chinese, but there's not a lot of um, black people. I remember walking around my neighborhood and being stopped by people saying, well, what's with you? What happened to the black people? Right, right, right. Or the Irish people? Where, would, where did the Irish go? As right. if you, each book is a kind of representation of your local area. And you can end up feeling a little bit like a, like a politician or something. But I, I wondered how you felt about that question. Like, I feel like white writers have a neutrality. They don't have to think about that kind of thing. Mm. How, is there a quotient of Jewish that has to happen in the book? Yeah. So, yeah, see, it's yeah. an interesting uh, matter. Yeah, no, almost that was, I think that took, uh, I think that's why the second book took only a quick eight years. <laughs> <laughs> but there was this great, pr I mean, it's the things you, you know, it's you get everything you want, you know, wanted to be a writer and to be received as a writer, but then all this weight gets put. I think it yeah. takes a while to understand there's uh, this on stage Zadie and then the other Zadie. You know, like you, you break it down, there's me writing, that I know, and then there's me, and then there's me up here. 
you know. Switching. Yeah, like exactly. Switching. All of them equally neurotic. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I guess it's the Jewish, I, I guess I was really alarmed by how much weight gets put on you. I mean, the second book, actually, I was going to have it fully like Judenrein. It was going to be a Jew-free <laughs> book. That was my intent with the Argentina book. And then they came in through the windows and the door, it was But then even everywhere. then, you're kind of writing in in response or in rejection of something, well, but which this means you're in exactly the same place. Exactly, anyway. and that's what took me years of like, it's the same as working on The Voice, where you talk about the first 20 pages, what I'm talking about was, was learning that, you know, that it's, I guess it's this idea of, uh, I almost said hegemony, I was like, never say hegemony. <laughs> but, um, way that's too, a good way personal too party. Yeah, yeah, never say like hegemony. But yeah. the point is, <laughs> this pressure of other, it's just, a, I always use James Baldwin as the example, where it's like, He's a brilliant example. Yeah, Lori, you, you comes into room and you'd be like, quick, choose, are you gay or black? Like, we don't have James but Baldwin if you have to, and, and, and this idea. He, ha he yeah. has beautiful responses, like another country is a beautiful yeah. response to that problem. The answer was everybody. I'm gonna do everybody. And well, he did it so yeah. um, exquisitely. And I, I think after a while, you stop thinking of it as a, a problem now, like I'm writing at the moment, and I really, appreciate it like it's a difficulty every day but when I'm reading like writers I really admire like Saul Bellow or um, even Franz a little bit th there's a difference if all the people you're writing about are smart for example or of a certain class yeah. or a certain educational level then you have this wonderful opportunity of pages of intelligent dialogue and people are saying this and people are saying that but when I'm writing I'm thinking but I, I want to try and include the people I came from I want to try and include the experiences but I knew but so you yeah. have to be kind of wily but it's easy to write about professors, is what I mean. Yeah. You can write about professors all day long. Which you do. But it's you harder to write about a variety of folks. Well, I think it's not a variety. This is the idea of where you came from. I'm, that's what, that was the big discovery, is that it's a universe. You know what I'm saying? It was raised in this closed bubble where there were only, there weren't non-Jews. There weren't even not religious Jews. That's a whole, that was the universe in which I was raised. And you only see, it's like, you know, your main characters and side characters. So none of those other people exist. So this idea, I think it's this weird outside cultural pressure which comes more greatly from Jews even than non-Jews, but this idea that you're supposed to see yourself as other. And I think it's really strange that like, you know, an African-American writer is supposed to say a black man walked into, that is the only way that a man is, you know, or that a woman's supposed to say, you know, like acknowledge. Well, like what I've been trying and what I'm writing at the moment, the only time I mention someone's color is if they're white. Yeah. I just wanted to give it a shot. Like exactly. everybody else is, that's is never spoken, but I, so I quite like to hear. And then a white girl walked into Absolutely. the room. Absolutely. Because that's what I think when I'm in a bar. Look, a white girl yeah. just walked into the room. So I just wanted to try and to turn that round a bit because it's so culturally experienced as natural. Well, uh, yeah, and that yeah. the idea that we, if we happen not to be white, that we walk around thinking of ourselves as exceptions. Well, it's or so something strange. E even interesting or something exotic. Well, it's the idea of like when we talk about books, we go all over. What are the books you love? They're like, you know, Russian or ch they're from all over the universe in time. You know, I think of like Candide. Candide makes me laugh like 500 years later. It's, you know, I've never Candide been. Candide makes you it laugh. It does. Well, she's like, <laughs> it's almost like you humor. like the Monty Python. It's funny. She's like, weren't you like raped and disemboweled? She's like, I got better. <laughs> I you know, she's that. really funny. <laughs> But, uh, you know, but just that idea that you can jump culture that way, it's very, you know, I always say that's the question when people say, can I give this to my Gentile friend? It's so, str you know, you would never do that with yeah. another book, you know. I anyway, always felt yeah. that when I, when I first um, was reading White Teeth aloud, uh, after reading, uh, when you were signing, like a, a, a Bengali woman would come up to me and say, I really liked Alsana, and then an old English guy come and say, I really like Archie, and I'd be like, the whole purpose of the book was to try and create some cross <laughs> yeah, effects right, where you right. had some, but it didn't seem to work. There is certainly a natural instinct in which people file to the experience they know. Yeah. But fiction does give you an opportunity to make a crossover, to make a little leap. Absolutely. I want to ask you a quick question. Sure. Sorry. We've got each other's books, it's so polite. Yeah. Um, it's this, on, on the matter of moral fiction, that there's a line in The Last One Way where it says, uh, how many crimes produce only victims, Gita wondered, everyone claiming innocence and everyone hurt? And that always interested me. When I'm writing, I'm always thinking about the idea that it's almost impossible for people to feel that they are the bad guy. It seems to be one of the most interesting things when you're making character. Even when you come across mass murderers, they, they think of themselves in a sympathetic light. And people are, find it incredibly difficult to think of themselves as doing wrong. Yeah, I, I guess I want to bring, it's a, maybe we can start a second charity night. I want to bring back right and wrong. Whatever <laughs> happened to that? You know, like this whole, I'm cr it makes me crazy in America now that if like there's the two plus two equals four group and the two plus two equals five group has to have equal time. You know what I'm saying? It's just not, you know, like cutting unemployment benefits and a tax cut for like people make every million dollars. Like it's not, 
it's not a position. It's just wrong. It's you I know, saw that so I just I just feel like it's time, you know. The sprinter is her name Marion John Johnson? Marion John. Jones. I saw her on TV a few days ago talking about uh, what she'd done and it had been kind of reworked. It wasn't a, a, even though it was a lie and she'd lied several yeah, times, yeah, yeah. she'd managed to convey it as, as a kind of, it's a weakness or a, a bad moment or I was right. in pain. That there seems to be no place where people can accept responsibility for yeah. their acts. Who hasn't hit the juice once in a while? <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, right in fiction, I find that the, one of the most useful things to remember that no matter, like on beauty, people are acting so selfishly, so uh, self-absorbedly, are funny, never yeah. able to find a moment. And I find in your stories it's the same. And you're nice. I had a big fight about on beauty. Where like, do you judge the father? I'm like, not at all. You know, like that I would have an issue with. Ha I have no issue with him at all. Well, I guess this is the idea. It's you know, I have big, you know, social ideas of responsibility, like education. There's social contracts, politics, social contracts, and people being human, which is what interests me about fiction. There's nothing. You're supposed to be flawed. It's o it's okay to be human, and I think that's more what than flawed. I mean, in your stories, people are perverse. No, yeah, it like happens. extremely perverse. Yeah. But also there's a feeling of, f of family in there. But I really appreciate where families can be at the brink of destruction. They, they talk to each other awfully. There's a, almost a kind of emotional violence, but there's still a family. And that was my experience. You know, you always had this idea, or my family did, obsessive idea of nice English families across the way <laughs> who spoke politely to each other and never argued at dinner and went on holiday. And in our house, th literally, there were things flying against the wall, people yeah. screaming yes. at the kind of marriage which is war for... 12 years, it just goes on and on and <laughs> That's on. That's so funny. And I, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I was going to say, it's like why I, we're playing one night like writer cards, and one of this writer starts to say, I had a bad relationship with my father, we're like, yawn. Yeah. Like, why, why are you <laughs> writing? But that's, it's funny, because we, as a family, we hold our cell phones here when we talk, because everyone's yeah. screaming. screaming. So people yeah. say you're screaming to me. I'm like, unless a dish is flying, yeah. I don't consider it a raised voice. But <laughs> I, I like that. In your fiction, there's a sense that people can be stretched very far before their relationships break. You can yeah. really cause some chaos. And that's, yeah. <laughs> that's my experience, too. Uh, you already mentioned Archie from, from White Teeth and Family and Bellow, so I'm going to make a question out of that. <laughs> but uh, did you read the Bellow letters? I've just started. You just started. You only have 900 pages to go. Yeah. I kind of memorized that Bellow's letters are out, and I'm obsessed with them. But the point is, I guess this idea of, uh, we'll stick with entitlement as a theme, but this, I guess, you know, I'm so, fa it's like the way DeLillo talks about it. There's two kinds of writers. There's the entitled and then sort of the religious sort of spiritual, and I like that idea, like when DeLillo talks about writing, it'll just be this idea like there's voices, you know, it's a very holy thing. I used to, when I started writing, I'm so thankful to be a writer, I used to write all night till I fell asleep on my desk or till I heard birds. You, know, you I was don't do that anymore, do you? No, God, no. no. But, um, but, the, but the idea, well, you get on a better schedule, it's not about getting lazy, but it's, no, you know, but I was all, yeah. But the idea is that, <laughs> that there's this, you know, entitled, right, this idea of like people who get it, it terrifies me, like I write from six to eight and then I have yeah. my constitutional and a massage, you know, this idea it's that so they were. so depressing, that information. Why do they spread it around? To scare It's others. awful. It's people who were just beginning to yeah. write. I always used to hate reading those interviews. Yeah. I wake up at eight and write for 12 hours and I go for, oh, shut up. Who yeah. cares what you do? Um, so Bello though, was born, it just fascinates me following the arc of his career. I mean, it's, for, you know, the New Yorker apparently attacked some book, like a second book that, you know, sold nothing. He was just a starting out writer and, you know, they offered to print a retract he wrote such an angry letter. But the point is he had this brutal honesty with everyone, which fascinates yes, me. Yes, but he uh, also had no doubt. Like, I mean, at the very early stage, and he has absolutely no, no doubt, doubt that he's a writer it, yeah. from the age of 24. It's absolutely terrifying. Yeah, so this is what I want to tell you about with character. My favorite letter in the book, I think it's to David Peltz, this guy who he had clearly taken some mortifying story of his friend and wrote, written it into Humboldt's gift, and the guy was furious. And Bella writes him and says, I used your story. I mean, it's, the, it's just amazing the way these letters are built. But he, he says to him, like, so what? I used your story. He goes, I've told you a million stories. Take my whole life. It's yours. Do what you want. He goes, I are, are I, When I read Bellow, those letters, I feel like he made s so many disasters in his life. I mean, personal yeah. disasters at the price of writing. To him, it was always the book comes first and the wife and then the second wife and the third wife and the fourth. How many? Six? Oh, it's awesome. They just comes, changed. Yeah. Never let, yeah, I don't know why any wife let him have a secretary because they were all the previous <laughs> yeah. secretary. Yeah. You know, like, Keep an eye yeah, on the secretary. The letters just changed. Yeah. I can't live without you, Beth. It's I can't live without you, Rhonda. Yeah. I can't, like, they're <laughs> awesome. But well, I uh, can't, I don't think, maybe our generation will be exactly the same, but I, just from the writers I know of our generation, I think there's, something of a horror of that 20th century idea of the writer where his writing is everything and his family can, will just have to deal with it, will just have to survive around the edges. I can't, to me, that idea of writing 
is is dead. I, I can't do that. Well, I think you recognize that you don't have to live that life. It's also a horrible life. Yes, and perhaps because there's so many more active women writers now working and making a living out of it, a woman yeah. is less, perhaps less likely to cause that kind of yeah. personal chaos. But then uh, reading those books, you know, you're still a young writer, you think, is that an inevitable part of a writer's life? They all start out nice, happy families, it all but looks I know fine. But I know you have these maps in your <laughs> head of other writers. Like I watch, you know, first there's a dream of living the right life, and then you see people who stop being able to hear or stop being able, I mean, some but people are built for that. But my argument is that the, the, always that the two things go together, like those kind of dramatic, uh, I don't know what you call them, personal failures or, or blindnesses in terms of the personal life. It's not that those things don't, aren't revealed in the prose too. Yes. You know, uh, the kind of blindness, for instance, that comes uh, with women in Bellow's work, I, that, that's in the work. It's there as oh well. Oh, God, I was going to say there's... An inability to see women in, in their fullness, in their roundness. So I don't think it's something... I don't think you get out of jail free. I don't think the life doesn't touch the work. It kind of penetrates it. Oh, no, well, I was going to say, one of my favorite genres, I feel like there's fiction, nonfiction, then there's your friend's books, where you're like, you can just... I mean, it's just amazing what you can yes. see. Secrets you have, things that unfold. So, I mean, that takes me back to the end of the letter, where he says to him, like, are you angry that I took your story, or are you angry that I made something beautiful out of it? Which is just oh my God. brutal. That's a 20th century writer thing to say. Yeah, it's a terrible... Yeah, he always doubles back around and says, I only say this because I love you, and then everyone's friends again. But nonetheless... But uh, I guess I just want to ask you, because I write like your macro micro writer, which we can talk about, but uh, you write closer worlds, and I write at this point, you know, until the next novel, but I've been writing distant worlds, and I'm really interested in writing a closer book. Watch out, friends. Um, but um, but I, I guess I'm just interested in, you know, Archie, and you, you talk in the essays about your father, you know, hearing Archie, or I just, even in On Beauty, I feel like you're afraid yeah. to walk through Cambridge unattended at this point. It, yeah. Um, it's, it, it's an immoral business r writing to that degree, you know, and I, when I think of every book I've written, I've definitely hurt people. A part of the, but part, part of it is a kind of blindness. Like, I notice it with writers all the time when you're reading other pe friends' work. You think, why didn't you change that name a little? And the thing with a writer, it's, it's psychotic, yeah. like the rhythm of a name, for example. Lots of writers will take a person, write about them, and change their name, but the rhythm, the syllabic rhythm, is exactly the same. Yeah. And if you know them, then you... And it's not conscious. But when you point it out to them, it's, it's as if it's a brick in the building, and if you remove it, the whole thing falls down, and you know logically that's not true. But writers get attached to these things in a kind of selfishness that I think, you know, is a, a little obscene when you think about the people who are hurt, hurt by it. Hurt often, yeah. I always think, if you look at a writer's arc in their career, um, it sounds so morbid, but there is a moment when their parents die and the books come alive again. Yeah, yeah. And reviews are always mysterious, like, what is this late flowering? The late flowering is that everybody's <laughs> Everyone's dead, dead that's and all. freedom reigns. Um, so that's, that's what <laughs> happens. It's really, it's brutal to say, but yeah. it, it's true. So uh, I, I have done s some of that. I haven't, again, when I'm doing it, I'm almost entirely unaware of it. What usually happens is that my husband or somebody else will point it out and then there is a point where you have a decision where you could, s you know, cut things back and remove them, but, but writers don't often, do they? No. That's the truth, and that's not a very pretty truth. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's a dirty business. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I want to talk to you, being that you're British. Um, <laughs> oh, you know, again, we both love the third person past. Um, yes, for the last yeah. living... Exactly, we are. I'm going to write the, the whole next book as you. Yeah. You went to the <laughs> talk. You nodded off. Um, I guess I just want to talk about the a huge obsession for me is negative space. You know, in work, um, sort of this idea. If you describe this, you know, to people on the stage, until the, we basically are in negative space. But the point is, you know, until you give us chairs, you have to add the. If you say I saw the talk, Zadie and Nathan were there, and there were you can add the chairs, and you have to add the table, and you have to add the water, and it's building from nothing. And it's sort of the absence. I, I'm a compulsive, compulsive drafter, compulsive yes. everything. But it's um, one of the first things I learned about you is something yes. I don't understand. Well, I was going to say, she has her macro and micro reader, which Zadie breaks down perfectly, which I keep saying because I want her to explain it. But it's <laughs> she does it so perfectly, I'm like, I think I am the worst of both worlds. <laughs> you know, I do I like both jobs of the macro and the micro. Well, I, I remember when I first met you in Capri, we were talking about what you were writing, and you started talking at a very fast rate and slightly obsessively Doesn't about a lamp like post me. in the story that it was the wrong kind and you'd gone back to check it and I said, what is wrong with this man? I get whole countries wrong. I yeah. forget the names of cities. I never go back and check them. So that kind of detail is awesome to me because it means a kind of care for a fictional world that I fear I don't really have. But I mean, the, the two different 
uh, kinds of writers we were talking about, what I suggested was a, a micromanager, someone who uh, writes, how, as I do, from the first page and finishes at the last page. That might sound obvious, but that never skips, uh, edits as they go along, and never moves things around, just starts very slowly in a straight line, and for three years, that's the work. Whereas people, who, uh, macros tend to have a big plan, no? Reorganize in the middle, change things around, um, change chapter headings, change titles. And uh, for me, that's incomprehensible. I'm sure the other route is incomprehensible, vice versa. But they're completely different ways of thinking about the novel. Well, I guess when I you know, saw you identifying that way, it really just amazed me. Because, I mean, On Beauty is a wildly complex structure. And I figured you had one of those, a beautiful mind, crazy person walls. <laughs> you, know. No. you know, I just couldn't believe it when you, you know, to hear that, that you wrote it straight away. Because, again, in use of negative space, I mean, you do seasons. I, uh, I've been thinking of Carver a lot lately. I'm thinking of Hemingway a lot. I'm thinking of the Americans. But you know, he'll do a story, and just the weather changes slightly. You do seasons so beautifully, and you jump. But I guess I was just wanted to talk about the boldness of negative space. You know, I guess everyone's read the book by now. But if you haven't, I'll just call it something really important stolen in the book at the end of the book, and the person's caught with it. And then you just jump like seven months. Uh, you know, with ease, you just move through seasons or skip these giant. It's the absences that inform the world for me. They make it real life. It's the way real seasons move. And I wanted to know how conscious that was. I, I think I've become more, the thing I'm writing now, I've become more conscious of it, that there needs to be emptiness and mystery. And even in a much more simpler way, I think gaps in text. That's why I love reading short stories, just to feel the space between one thing or another. The density of novels sometimes depresses me. Like the kind of uh, attempt to take the world entire and include everything. I'm more and more attracted to gaps and for le letting the reader do their own thing, make their own jumps, because that's part of the freedom you're gifting them, not to kind of pin them down with fiction or cover them in fiction until they can barely <laughs> that's breathe. Funny. That's a different kind of uh, novel. But also noticing, like, I went to New York Public Library recently and they showed me a Virginia Woolf to the Lighthouse, the original manuscript. Oh, you got manuscript. to ask to your thing? I know what I'm asking It for. was so beautiful. And yeah. one of the things I noted is that when pl planning her book, the plan for the book is about maybe 12 words, literally, just, just little uh, numbers, a uh, few words like uh, long, quiet, uh, sun, sea. And I, I really wanted to take that back to my students to remind them of that fact. You know, when you're teaching, you create all these elaborate theories of how people write. And, but the reality is, it's so gentle and so light for so many people. Yeah. And then I included in the book is her going back and reading it and making a note to herself. And she writes at the bottom, I see I used to be uh, loose first and then tight. And now I'm tight and get loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought, all these people writing these complex PhDs on Wolf, and, and her own feeling was, sometimes I'm loose and sometimes I'm tight <laughs> in, in various orders. Yeah. But I, I writers need to retain that memory, even if they're teaching or studying, because or, that's the real way you talk about your art to yourself, yeah. which is kind of intimate. This is, I think, Zadie would referring to seeing this manuscript. Is this for the project at the library to see what you? No, I was just speaking oh, there, and, and they gave me a treat. They showed me these. Um, they have all these treasures. Amazing. They have the cane Virginia Woolf left on the side of the yes, river I saw that before. Too, yeah. You know, that's everybody wants yeah. to see that. Extraordinary. But I, I'm going to do something there, and you know, you can ask for something when you're there. And I want to see something all erudite, except I know they have Winnie the Pooh. They have the Pooh Bear Don't doll. Ask for it. And I was like, I kind of, no I know I should, yeah, <laughs> ask for something, you know, smarter. But I'm like. <laughs> I kind of want to see poo. Oh, I, <laughs> I wanted to tell you briefly, um, uh, another thing they showed me was George Eliot's notes for Daniel Deronda, where yeah. I literally almost started crying, because she had, off her own back and really unnecessarily, written notes on about every aspect of Judaism you can imagine. Like, she used maybe 10% of it. There's yeah. books and books yeah. of notes on everything. And that kind of thoroughness, she's a completely different kind of writer, yeah. but she needed to know the entire world in order to show that bit of it, no, which yeah. is also a Hemingway quote about yeah. the iceberg. You have to show the tip, you need to know right, the right, base. Right, right. But that's extraordinary. Like, because it's a, ro a rod to kind of strike your own back. No, no one's forcing her. You willingly undergo this but ridiculous But I think this process. is like your negative space thing, where I really feel, you know, like in the novel, to write 10,000 chapters on this woman's life and write her parents and her grandparents and write through it and write through it and then throw that all, the, all away you know, and have her zip a boot, and that moment inform. You know, I, it's because of the infinity. Right now, that you understand that, like this room will never happen again. It's actually from infinity. Right now, that we're all here together. It's impossible 
you know, and you and, and I are stone, communicating. That's an incredibly exactly. deep thought for us. Yeah. Well, I just think about that a lot, and I feel like that's how <laughs> novels work. Like, they don't have our whole life. You know what I'm saying? You and I have this whole friendship and all these stories. What's seen here is like the no you know, people can get that information. I feel like the background information needs to be there. Yes. Indeed. Um, so there, I'm just happy at these things when I know George Eliot's a woman. You, I, when you're self-educated, I can't even tell you I the didn't, mistakes. I just put that in an essay I wrote. I didn't yeah. know until my second no, year in college. No, me neither. Forget it. Nobody tells nobody you because tells you. you have to work it out by yourself. I yeah. was so ashamed. Somerset Maugham. I also thought it was Antigon. <laughs> Antigon, I said in class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Antigone. Oh. Yeah. You know, I, I say Pen yeah. I was saying in front of about this, but I mentioned Penelope, and there, yeah. there, <laughs> yeah, there Penelope are no is Penelopes. Popular. That's a really bad enough. There are only Penelopes. Um, I'm worried about our time. Should we open to questions? Does anybody have oh. any? Are we okay? Are we, I think, yeah. Should we, we jump to questions? I don't know. Um, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Howard uh, has sex with a very young girl and pretty much ruins his marriage. Also has sex with the professor. Um, you know, when I was younger, I would have been extremely judgmental about such behavior. I remember, for example, finding an incredibly mild porn magazine in my father's pocket when 15, like so mild, like razzle, they used to call them get like a tiny bit of nipple yeah. in a corset. And I was horrified. I couldn't speak to him for two years. <laughs> Extremely judgmental child. So um, you wrote your essay, uh, a tiny bit of nipple. Yeah. But uh, as you get older, it becomes perfectly obvious that, uh, that people don't always want the best for themselves. You know, they can't help themselves. The desire is incredibly strong. So I, t I totally forgive Howard. And I also think, as someone who's only been married, whatever, it's been six years, that a marriage of that length in the book, which is, you know, coming on 30, is no easy matter. It's an extraordinary act of will, a marriage of that length. So I, I suppose I do forgive him. I wish he would behave better. Um, I wouldn't marry him myself. But uh, I have sympathy for him, I guess. Hi, guys. Um, we brought some, uh, some students who actually were probably going to have to leave soon so I don't get killed by parents. <laughs> um, but I was hoping that you could just talk to some teenagers about kind of the, just the idea of literacy and when when it sunk into you, obviously it's extremely relevant to your lives because you're writers. Um, but um, just you know, it, how, how do how do you make how to, how do you see making literacy relevant for young people who maybe um, don't necessarily always see see it as being something that's important to their lives? I just think it's the mo first of all, it's uh, what we probably do talk about not on stage. We are here as writers, but we weren't writers, and that never ends is not strange. Like that idea, you know, it's all I dreamed about, but I didn't know, I don't know why I dreamed about it. It's a totally odd dream right. to have, but nonetheless, so I always say that to students. Like it's just, I mean, the writing act itself is executing the unexecutable, but I don't understand. The thing that you want to do most in life, you should do, because you're going to do that best. I really think you're going to do better as, I don't know what, a happy astronaut than a really depressed accountant or whatever, or the happy accountant and depressed, you know. So again, I'm really into pursuing dreams. But I just, about writing, I think it's just this, it remains to be the most subversive, wonderful form in the universe. I mean, it's the only thing that is totally crafted inside your head. It's symbols, it's words. You know, nobody, it's the only thing you ever say, you know, when did that happen to me? Oh, I read that. You know, you don't think, you don't remember that. Oh, that was, you know, Al Pacino, you know, in Dog <laughs> Day Afternoon. You know, this, and I just feel, to me, this idea, if it says the family kitchen, you know, we're in New York, family kitchen might be on the 20th floor. It might be, you know, in the sub-basement. You know, for somebody else, it's, a, you know, a butler cooking. Somebody else, it's their father cooked. I just like this idea, the communication. I mean, it's deep in there, but I can't say anything about reading until you find a book. And I know Zadie said similar things in essays, but it's, and she can do the Foster quote perfectly after. But I remember reading Malamud and or wrought these stories and feeling, oh, oh my God, across space and time, or Babel, dead people, like this was written just for me. Mm. And I don't mean that lightly, and I'm not kidding. Like it was written for me. And as a writer, I know I'm putting things, you are working that way. And when you have that connection, I think you just have to find the right book, is my answer. But I also think, I mean, just thinking about uh, young people and reading, like I think of me and my siblings. My mom was such a, a big a reader, not an encouraging of reading. But we've all, like my brother is a comedian and my other brother is a rapper, but we all make our life reading and writing in one way or another. And um, when th what, they, what they do is very different from what I do, but I recognize in all of us the passion of readers. You know, my brother, my youngest brother who raps, he's a reading obsessive. He reads hip-hop lyrics and he listens to hip-hop lyrics, but just we're able to uh, design our own lives, you know, in a way that I think my mother was trying to suggest to us, that it would give us an independence 
that we wouldn't have otherwise. Oh, Even if we never made a living out of it, if we, we would have this little world that was ours. And I, I still feel that very much. I felt that when I was a college student. I felt that when I was a teenage reader, that she'd given me this thing where I got to have this thing which was mine. I could be by myself. I didn't have to answer to anyone. And I could have this uh, kind of isolated experience. And it was great. And I think anyone who, like you're saying about there, I think anyone who does do anything reads. You don't have to read, but I feel like, you know, whatever your dream is, those people read books. We hope. Not anymore. I'm talking about last year. <laughs> <laughs> Uno Mas, anyone? Bueller? Yeah. Bueller. What, is the, what do you think of the transition from um, electronic books? I don't, I don't really know. I, I, I just bought my husband, and I better not say because it's Christmas present, but one of those things <laughs> which will enable uh, him to read <laughs> but not a, not on the screen. Yeah. And I tested better it out be in an the iPad, store. Is all and I'm I, saying. I, I, <laughs> I hadn't seen it, and it, to me it looked completely natural. It looked great, in fact. Yeah, it's point, it's yeah. not about the format, it's just about the mindset of reading, which is about being willing to spend time in quietude. And, and in that exercise, like today, trying to write and read, I put on the Freedom program, you know, to knock out the internet. I want to talk hours. about Freedom, it's amazing. Such a great program. And I had to, halfway through the day, give my husband my mobile phone because I was checking my email on it, like a nine-year-old. <laughs> so if my job is to spend time in quietness and to, I spent almost 15 years learning how to be someone who studies and reads. And if I can be distracted so badly that I have to ask someone, please, will you take this phone and switch it off and put it in another room because I'm not going to be able to work? That, that's kind of where I get my more general idea about the form from. Maybe I'm just a desperate person. I have no willpower. But I don't think I'm alone. No, I think no. a lot of people are having this kind of problem with their willpower and their ability to work and read. So that frightens me because I'm a grown-ass woman <laughs> and I can't control myself. So what if you were... Nine, what if you were 12, what if you were 15? That just seems to me kind of bleak. Oh, I have two, that's, you're speaking the gospel, but I really think, because it's like my, I'm obsessed with this 23 minute idea where I feel like, you know, everyone in here might be a genius, like everyone in here, and you, that moment of genius might be 23 minutes away where you need to stare at the wall for 22 minutes, and I really worry about that where the anxiety comes before the moment of like epiphany, and I really worry that if you need 23 minutes of silence to think, and every seven minutes you refresh your browser and look at Gawker and send a text, you never get past that minute seven. You're never going to get True. to this clean. Because we know it exactly. I can't tell you how many years of training. I'm a lazy, lazy suburban child. Like yeah. learning to sit is And crazy. read. Yeah. But that was the horrible thing about today. The thing I was trying to read was Rilke, Letters to a Young Poet. So the pages I'm reading are saying explicitly, you need to learn patience. Yeah. You need to learn to spend time and sit in silence and not worry f about a book in one year, or he says one year or 10 years, doesn't matter when it's written. You need to learn and wait. I thought, my God, if you could, I was reading it because I want to give a copy of that book to, to all my students. I thought that's kind of crazy advice now to say to someone, yeah. to, to cultivate that kind of patience when they can't even wait an hour. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. But I, I just think I have faith that as in every revolution, young people are smart. They know what they're doing. They'll roll back something if they need to. They'll make changes. I don't think they'll just go like sheep. Yeah. I hope not. I, in my experience, there's always a group who say, no, thank you, I'm going to work it out. And I you, think that'll and, happen again. And you have to be honest. If you're doing work, you have to be honest. You know what I'm saying? If you're that person who's like, we need another aircraft carrier, we don't. You know what I'm saying? That's not how we fight wars now. And I really just feel like if the form's supposed to die, then let it die. Yes, you know that'll what I'm saying? be fine, because it's meant to. Yeah, well, this is it. The painting did not die because of the photo, and the photo did not die because of the film. Like, the silent film died because of the talkie, and it, you know, it should. So I feel like if we can't... <laughs> it had to. You know, it had no choice. Yeah, if we can't make the transition, then, you know, then own it. Structure. Is there is there any way that um, you're inspired when you're creating new narrative structures by music or by visual art? I mean, is, is there some way that you, in some ways, kind of use a mimesis in that way to create a new structure? And at the moment, very, very directly, because I've been reading a, a whole lot of graphic novels, and the more I read them, um, from the geniuses like Chris Ware down to like 
lowly sidewalk artists who give out the tiny zines. The way narrative moves from frame to frame, it just really opened my head. I, I was always trying to do a lot of uh, legwork between scenes, which are completely unnecessary. And realizing how your eye passes through a graphic novel, obviously the visual helps enormously. But it's also just a confidence that a young brain will move very quickly, doesn't need that much information, can jump, and will understand. I just found that so refreshing. You know, I turn and read a graphic novel and I feel kind of cleansed, like that this is a, a new way to go about telling a story, or new to me. So I found that really useful. Sorry, um, yeah. I, I guess, I mean, my whole life, uh, every book, you say it so nicely, but sort of this idea if you locked somebody, a writer in the room with like 10 pages of a story they've written and asked them to finish it, they could never, it's just of a time. But every book feels like the beginning and starting again. But I've just fallen in love. I've, it's so weird you want these, ty like writer of literary short fiction, it's, I just feel free with story now. I mean, this year I did two translations and I'm working on a play and it's, I just feel like I'm starting at 40. I'm, I'm glad I'm not a gymnast. There's not enough you know, <laughs> cortisone in the world to keep me going. But, you know, but it's just, yeah, so I'm just in love with new form now. I just feel like a storyteller. It's very exciting. One more? I guess along those lines, I'm wondering how different your process is between genres, if you're both writing fiction and nonfiction or journalism? Um, with nonfiction, I've really, like the essays I've written recently, I felt like I wanted to phone up my professors and thank them because I realized they gave me a gift. The way I was trained, which was very, not in my school, my school was kind of chaotic, but when I got to university, we were intensely trained in essay writing. And so I, I can marshal a lot of information and organize it quite quickly. Um, and I really owe them. I didn't realize it at the time, but I never thought it would come in useful. You never think essay writing is going to be useful. And then I found that I could do it in the world, and, and it was a good thing. Um, but the main difference for me is, is the nausea. I don't feel nausea when I write an essay. I feel happy and excited. It's interesting material. It's object. I can write about something that interests me. But when I sit down to write fiction, I feel like I'm going to be sick. Isn't that great? That's, that's, that's everybody, yeah, I It's think. what you care about. Yeah. Well, do you think that's the reason? Well, I hope Well, no, so. you care about that. The essays are st they're truly stunning. And it's funny. I feel that training and think about that. I was like, it, you know, anyway. But um, no, I, yeah, it's, it's, I do think it's what's most obsessive in your heart in some weird way. You know, they, with the play, I never, I missed deadlines by a decade. I, you know, they could tell me, like, I need it all to, gotcha, boss. You know, it's just, I had no Nine reference years. points to be <laughs> afraid of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah? Oh, yeah. And, and oh, what inspired you to be a writer? Yeah. Nathan, you want the first to think about it. Uh, it goes back to it being a subversive form, I guess. I just, I, uh, my mom's here, I just wanted out of our town so badly. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to do something. I thought, like, maybe I'll do finance, maybe. And just books really spoke to me. And everyone has access to generally a, a pencil and a piece of paper. And to me, I don't know, I just always love language. And yet yeah, mixed the same way of wanting change and having a dream and loving books. I guess if, if you know what it is, here's the real sincere answer. If writing saved your life, then you want to write. You know what I'm saying? I was in this very closed religious world, and I wasn't getting answers to the questions I needed. And I found in books people who had no answers but we're willing to look at these terrifying questions straight on, and that just hooks you. I don't think mine's pretty much the same answer. I, I, I went to the public library again recently. It's all I seem to do these days, to go and see Jay-Z talk. And, uh, That's awesome. It was awesome. And he was talking about uh, a Macy project where he grew up. And the thing which is really striking is he talks again and again about the whole reason he started writing and, and um, doing hip hop was to get out of Macy projects. And the moment he was out, all he wrote about was Macy projects. And that's entirely my experience. Like I really did not want to be in Wilsdon for the rest of my life. I only write about Wilsdon. I'm writing a novel about Wilsdon now. So you do this weird round trip where you try so hard to escape this place and, and the people you were from and, and your background, and then it ends up being the only thing of value, the only thing you love, the only thing worth writing about. So uh, that seems to be the, the way it's been with me. I think that's a beautiful note. I'm going to clap for you. Thanks for having Thank us. You.